Welcome to the Interlocked Bible Study. We're on Lesson 25, and we'll be discussing the decline of the kingdom. In this particular case, we're going through the story of Israel and the lessons that we learn today from their story, their narrative. It teaches us so much about God, who he is, what he's like, it teaches us about his reaction to mankind when he's entered into a contract with them and their responses. Are they strong? Are they weak? How, how are they doing? What, what is the, the assessment? Um, and who did God send in order to warn them and to help them and remind the individuals of the conditions of the contracts? So we have a really intense lesson here in lesson 25, and we'll cut it up into different segments because of the content. So by review, um, we looked at that during the time of the judges, as Israel settled into the promised land, the, the Bible records that as a nation, the people rebelled against God. So that was typical of Israel's conduct after all God had done to bring them out of pagan nations, first of all, Abraham, and then later his descendants from Egypt, uh, to, so that they can become a special nation to himself, a different counterculture from all other nations. Now we see them rebelling, and it's continual. And we see issues with that and problems as they uh, follow through this process of digression and, um, and decay and corruption, and then fall into a tremendous, tremendous consequences of their decisions. So then during this period of the kings, the Bible shows that Israel's leaders too were overall rebellious toward him. And we see the, how important it is to have key leadership in place, leadership that is humble, that believe and understand that they are under rulership themselves, under the authority of God and not an authority unto themselves. So be careful how you appoint and we appoint leadership, uh, one that is humble, one that is, is um, uh, reflective of of. of, of a person who can indeed submit and and not live in rebellious in rebellion to God Himself. So the kingdom of Israel was divided as a consequence. Uh, King Solomon disobeyed. Um, God tore the kingdom from him, and he divided it into two sections: Israel in the north and Judah in the south. Now both kingdoms were supposed to worship Yahweh as God. Both of them were to equally walk in submission and uh, under the, uh, the covenant of Mount Sinai that Moses had given. Both were to walk in, that, um, in obedience to that. Yet uh, Israel, as we studied in our last lesson, rushed headfirst uh, through their king, the leadership of their king rushed headlong into paganism rejecting the Davidic lineage, rejecting Jerusalem and the center of worship, rejecting Yahweh himself, uh, rushing headlong into paganism. And so we see in Judah, although it wasn't as quickly of a decline, it, they also suffered from kings that followed. Uh, they were men after God's own heart. They followed God. They were good kings. And then there were kings that did evil in the eyes of the Lord. And so Judah also had a very rocky, um, rocky kingship and, and uh, followership of Yahweh. So both kingdoms fell into tremendous decline. And we see here in our timeline, as we move through creation all the way through the, the uh, recreation in the new world, the new earth, new heavens, uh, we are at this kind of like this middle point um, in the story, in the narrative of the, of the Bible, uh, talking about this kingdom age. We've talked about the kings for Israel, King David, King Solomon, the king divided, and now we're talking about the decline of the kingdom. 
and some of the ramifications of that, we will then follow through with uh, God's destruction and um, cursing of the people of Israel, both Israel and Judah, and going into exile. Uh, that will be covered in detail into later lessons. So, uh, let's begin by looking at the role of the prophets during this period of time. As you can see in this chart, um, the period of the kings covers uh, a tremendous amount of time, 200 years for Israel, 400 plus years for Judah. And so, there, God, God does not leave these kings unattended to. Uh, he doesn't let them just do whatever they want to. He sends prophets to speak to them and to encourage change, to motivate behavioral change, worldview change, to recall that repentance, worldview change, changing your mind, which change, leads to behavioral change. And so the prophets were sent by God to, uh, as he faithfully reminded over and over and over to the kings and to the people, repent, these, these idols that you're worshiping are worthless. Um, they can't even talk. They're dumb and mute. Um, they don't do anything. They just are a figment of your imagination that you conjured up and created a out of wood or steel or gold or some uh, material. Um, and so total, God sent a uh, 16 prophets who wrote the books of the prophets. And uh, we'll be looking that uh, more into detail on those. But you see here on, on, on this chart, uh, who those, those prophets are, the 16 of them, uh, some of them lived earlier on in the history of Israel and Judah, some later on. You see uh, many kind of concentrated in the period right below the Babylonian captivity of Judah, uh, a concentration of, of people that God sent right before the final um, uh, capture or captivity of the Israelite people. So there were different prophets in their writings. Some we call major prophets, others we call minor prophets. The concept be behind major prophets is that they wrote a lot. The book of Elijah, uh, excuse me, uh, Isaiah, for example, is a very long book, very lengthy, very detailed, lots of content. Uh, the book of Jeremiah is the same, and Ezekiel. So they are considered major prophets just for the content of, of writings that they had. The other 13, however, are known as minor prophets because they wrote less. That's the only reason. It doesn't mean that you had some prophets that were more amazing or cool or others that were, were freaks and, and, and didn't do a good job. It had nothing to do with that. It, it just means how much content they left in writing. So during the period of the kings, the prophets were active in both countries, both in Judah and Israel. The book of the prophets make up 17 books of the Bible, even, even more than the gospels themselves. Um, the Gospels, they cover four books in the New Testament. And these guys, they have 17 books that are covered in the Old Testament. So it must have been, this gives us a sign, a signal, that this must have been a really important message that the prophets had. Uh, if, if God's going to invest that much time and energy in having these guys write down his word and his history and record it, it must have been extremely important to him. But what uh, was the job that God sent these prophets to do? What did they do and, and, and what did they write about? First, we need to understand some of the background. So what is going on in, at this time in history? Well, it's predominantly about God's discipline in his frustrating relationship with Israel the very people he called out to himself to be separate, to be holy. That's what separate means, to be set aside for his purposes, to bring about his glory and his honor, to make him known. 
uh, to reflect his character. God called them out from pagan nations to be countercultural. And, and he set, a, set, set in motion contracts, agreements between them. Some of the contracts were conditional and others were unconditional. The Abrahamic contract was unconditional. God made his decision and, and, and did not depend on people, people's conduct. It was one-sided, whereas the, the Sinaitic or Mosaic covenant after they came out of Egypt was, was, um, it, was it was together. It was done in a uh, contractual form between two people, uh, to, between God and between man, between Israel. And both were to uphold their end of the bargain. And Israel is failing miserably. God knows this. He knows, he knew Israel's weakness long before he even called them out. So it wasn't a surprise to him. And so he sets forth uh, the conditions in his words in, in, in scripture as he's laying it out, for example, in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 28, verses 15 to 68, in Leviticus 26, verses 14 to 39, he talks about what the, what, what's going to happen to you guys if you, if you um, walk away from me, if you ignore me, if you don't fulfill your end of the bargain. Uh, you, you'll, you'll be blessed if you do, if you hold up your end of the bargain, you're going to experience tremendous prosperity, economic prosperity, good weather, cooperative nature, military success and peace in all sides, population explosion and growth, uh, con God's continual presence with them, his Shekinah glory, the glory, uh, uh, visible glory of God in, uh, among them uh, in, the, in the tent of meeting known as the tabernacle and the temple. These would be tremendous blessings that they would have. They would literally be renowned through all the, all the earth. And, and we saw a glimpse of that with the Davidic uh, kingdom. And then as he passes it on, David passed it on to his son Solomon, uh, meeting up to tremendous fame and, and success within all the earth. Uh, to the point where Queen of Sheba and so many other uh, leaders of nations around the world would come to him and listen to his wisdom, wisdom that came from God. So God, God, uh, when he said, when you follow me, you hold up your end of the bargain and you will receive tremendous blessing. However, the opposite is going to happen if you do not, if you disobey, if you rebel, if you turn away from your, your end of the bargain, you will be cursed. In fact, there's five stages of cursing that you'll be going through and experiencing. One, the stage one is disease and sickness. I mean, you're talking about physical and psychological uh, problems here. You're going to experience men, uh, military defeat, economic disaster, and it just keeps digressing from there. In stage two, you have the famine. This, all this is laid out in Deuteronomy and Leviticus. Uh, in stage three, you're going to find death of your children and livestock, population de decrease. Uh, stage four, starvation, epidemics, crushing, military defeat. In uh, the worst stage of all, five, cannibalism what cannibalism yeah it says they were uh, uh held up in 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 siege in inside their cities and their city walls uh they they fell all the way down they digressed all the way down to eating their own children cannibalism in order to survive death enemy invasion exile terror and psychological problems God's presence removed from them. I mean, the, 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 the list just goes on. And, and th so through this entire period that we saw in our chart earlier, Israel's just experienced this tremendous digression. It just goes from bad to worse. Uh, and so the, the entire period is characterized by God's discipline. But Yahweh's goal here is not to destroy Israel. No, he loves Israel. He called Israel his son. Um, you, as you see through the prophets and some of the language that they use, you see that God uh, considers them as like a, in a marriage contract between a man and a woman and that, that love and passion 
that can be uh, beautiful between a, a husband and a wife. God, God had this love and passion and zeal for Israel. And, and expected it to be reciprocated in this, in this contractual marriage that he had um, as, as an example. Uh, so, no, his goal was not to destroy them and annihilate the people group and, and, and start over, although he at one point offered Moses that option. But Moses said, no, uh, that's not where you want to go with this God. And God repented. It said he changed his mind and continued with the Abrahamic covenant. Uh, so no, uh, his goal was to restore, restore them to fellowship with him as his obedient children. Yeah. I mean, as parents, uh, I'm a parent, I'm a father. I want my children uh, to be restored in their fellowship with me, in their communion with me, to be able to have unity with me. Um, I don't want to destroy my children. However, I did discipline my children as they were growing up when, so that they could understand that uh, it, if you want to have peace in our home, there were certain rules you had to follow. You, if you didn't follow those rules, uh, which were, there were godly rules. They were, go there were rules that brought harmony, not unrealistic expectations uh, that frustrated our children. No, They're, they were practical. Um, everyone did their chores. If you obey authority, which was uh, me as a father and my wife as a mother, uh, all will go well with you. There will be harmony because as I have three children and as each of the three children walk in submission to dad and mom, there's peace between the three of them because they are walking in uh, under our guidance, our authority. And so, uh, uh, however, when one of them would, would uh, rebel, there was discipline involved. Um, they saw that there was consequences to their actions, and they were addressed, confronted by that. And so God, God is the one who laid out this model. Uh, I didn't come up with it. It wasn't my wife's idea. We are pattering our lives uh, as parents after God's uh, system, uh, after his conduct, his characteristics. And we see his characteristics coming out. Yeah, all throughout history, starting with Adam and moving all the way forward uh, throughout the history of Israel and all throughout his time on earth, uh, Jesus Christ, as, as uh, he walked among mankind and as he lays it out in Revelation, the book, the final book of the Bible, you see how God views sin and rebellion and that there's always discipline involved. But the discipline isn't destruction. It isn't complete and total rejection. It's, it's to draw them back, uh, to bring them back into fellowship as obedient children, not, not once again as, as rebellious and creating chaos in the home. No, uh, once again, it's restoration um, uh, to be able to thrive as, as, as children, as, as young adults. Uh, to be able to themselves know how to conduct their family and be good stewards of, of all that God has given them. So we see that because of God's unconditional love toward his people, he was not going to allow them to denigrate, to degenerate, uh, unchecked, and destroy themselves. That is the consequence of sin. Sin, sin you never know how far it's going to take you. Uh, uh, one little teeny sin leads to another just a little bit bigger sin and then another bigger sin, another bigger sin. And, and, and it leads you down this path where you don't know how far it's going to take you. That's why uh, one of the things I addressed very, very uh, early on and, and, and severely with my children is lying. Do not lie. Do not disobey. Honor your dad and your mom. Don't talk back to your mom. Don't sass her. You, you know, if you start down this road, you will, you will find that it will take you to a place that you do not want to find yourself later on in life. And so they had to be confronted. And so likewise, God is confronting a sin. He doesn't want them to uh, go unchecked and destroy themselves. Divine discipline is actually a sign of God's election and his election, his elected love and great kindness toward us. And this is what, what uh, he was trying to teach Israel. 
guys, you're going down the wrong road. You, you are, are loving idols. You're following after them. Yeah. There's Ashereth who, who um, is the goddess of, of, of love and passion and, and, and sexuality. And so you're, you're lusting after her ways. Uh, and, and men would go to these groves where there were prostitutes in the shrine, married men. Uh, and they would prostitute themselves. Um, and so uh, the, the, the consequences of these gods that they were lusting after uh, were, were completely out of Yahweh's um, will for them as a nation set aside for his honor and his glory. The reason why Israelites uh, from Judah and Israel uh, um, suffered so is because of their misunderstanding of God. They didn't, they lost touch with who God is. That's why you and I can't get away from the Bible. Don't, don't drift from it. Read the Bible. You can't drift. Otherwise, uh, we forget who God is. We may think we have it all together, but then you find uh, you start buying into secularistic ideas, wor worldviews that are contrary to God's word. And this is what happened to Israel. And, 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 and they passed along uh, an entirely new religion and worldview to their children and their children's children and their children. And so they, they completely had the wrong concept of Yahweh. In fact, they, they believed that Yahweh was just another God. He was just another, another bloke out there alongside of Molech and, and, and Baal and Ashtoreth and, and all these other gods. That, uh, Egypt had a ton of them, Ra and you name it. And so um, Israel, the Israelites, these God followers, the, God, the people of God, just put Yahweh in the same category as the rest of the idols that were out there. And so uh, they had a completely misunderstanding of who God is, not understanding that God is not uh, finite. He's not made of, of clay or gold. He's not an image. You can't create an image from the invisible spirit God. God is spiritual. And that's why he said, do not make any images. Don't even try to make images of me. Don't go there. I am not an image-bearing God. I am spirit. And uh, thou, therefore, make no images of me. So, uh, mankind stuck up God in the same category. Oh, yeah, there's this God, that God, the other God. Oh, yeah, and then there's Yahweh. Yeah. I will see which one's most advantageous to me. Uh, yeah, I need my crops to grow. So, uh, I'll try Molech today in Baal, but uh, if that doesn't work, I'll talk to Yahweh and see if that helps. Maybe I'll light a candle. Maybe I'll burn some incense. Maybe I'll maybe I'll find some powerful words that 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 uh, work for three different gods and see which one listens to me. You know, wh whatever works for me. as long as I get what I want. The the worldview of the people were messed up. Um, many of the animistic ethnic groups uh, where uh, missionaries are taking the gospel to, that is the setup that they have. They appease and manipulate. They appease in different multiple ways, looking for ways of making a, a God happy, or they manipulate them. They try to do different, uh, different uh, incantations and things to guarantee that this spiritual being is going to do exactly what they need. Uh, maybe it's to heal someone or to be healed, or maybe it's to, um, to, for protection from their enemies or not to get, uh, be bitten by venomous snakes. Whatever it is, they're appeasing and constantly trying to manipulate these gods and spirits that are all around them and nature as well. And so the Israelites know we're no better. They, they became very animistic in this way, where, where they, 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 uh, all the things around them were objects of appeasement and manipulation so that uh, even Yahweh would just do whatever they wanted them to do. He's, he's the genie. You rub the bottle and poof, you get, they get three wishes. I mean, isn't Christianity riddled with that today? We often even are in uh, without being conscientious of it. We, we pray to our, our Heavenly Father, 
and we ask him for things. And, and let's be careful of how, how our heart attitude that we not fall into this category of, okay, if, if God doesn't work, I'll turn to the doctor. If this doctor doesn't work, I'll turn to that medicine or that. Just, just be, be, be aware that Yahweh, God, is, is infinite and sovereign over all things. No matter if you, if you go see the doctor, do not, uh, do not trust in the doctor above God. Always trust in God as the sovereign one. Walk with him by faith uh, and trust in him. And yes, sometimes he will heal through natural means or supernatural means. That's, that's his business. But we walk by faith in a God that is infinite and is incompar- it's in, he's incomparable to any other gods or any other things uh, made on earth. All right, so let's look at these uh, prophets in a little more detail. Who are they? Well, they were basically God's historians, right? If you and I did not have recorded history, of the writings of the prophets accessible to us today, we would miss out on a big chunk of knowing who God is. Remember who wrote Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, uh, Numbers, Deuteronomy? It was Moses. Moses was a prophet. He was a historian. He wrote down the biblical narrative, the story of who God is. If we didn't have that, we wouldn't know who he's who he is. If God keeps covenants, their contracts, does he even make contracts? Is God a liar? Does he say one thing and do another? Um, does does he call a people to himself and then destroy them later? What is this guy? I mean, I really want to know if I'm going to put my faith and trust in him. You know, I I believe in Jesus Christ with all my heart. That, that through the shedding of his blood, I have salvation and forgiveness of sin. Man, if I'm going to trust in him, I need to know that he's trustworthy. Who did he come from? Where, what, who is he? Um, did, was he? Is he created being? Is he, is he sinful or not sinful? Can he make mistakes or not? Uh, does, he, does, he, does he lie? Uh, you know, how, how secure is my faith in this person? So if we did not have the Old Testament and and God's historians, the prophets, recording detail by detail of God's God's narrative, his story, his his words, uh, messages to the people of Israel, and then Israel's response to that and understand these contracts that that God laid out in, in, uh, in the Old Testament, I'm sorry, but our faith, our Christianity, our religious system as Christians would be very shaky, very shaky indeed. Then why would that? Then I would. Then I would be tempted if if it, if I had shaky ground for my faith in Christ. Then why not try Buddha for a while? Why not try uh, um, Islam and Muhammad for a while? Why not try transcendental meditation for a while and see if that works? Um, why not work, hang out with the animistic tribal people who, who believe in all these plethora of spiritual beings and, and they see some pretty wild stuff. You know, there's some really supernatural stuff that happens. Uh, why not hang out with them for a while and believe and believe their system? So uh, our faith is on shaky ground unless we have this Old Testament. We call it Old Testament, but this, this biblical narrative um, uh, from the prophets uh, in place. So we must take this seriously and pay close attention. So the prophets were Yahweh's historians, and they wrote the world's first analysis of the true meaning and purpose of history. God inspired them to interpret and record historical events from his all knowing perspective. So it wasn't written from just tom and harry and joe's perspective it was written from god's perspective and 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 he used the prophets within their cultural context their language within the framework of the israelite people so they explained what yahweh was doing and why things were happening the way they were god didn't want mankind to just freely speculate on why history was turning out the way it did Otherwise, we'll get all kinds of interpretations. That's why it's not good when you sit down in a Bible study, you read a passage of scripture and you have 20 people in the room, and then you just kind of open it up and say, um, folks, what is this 
verse mean to you? And then 20 people give 20 different interpretations of what this verse means to them. And, and I understand the idea behind it. Okay, God in, uh, emphasizes certain things we learn from, from specific passages of scripture, but you cannot uh, allow 20 people to come out with 20 different interpretations. There's only one single interpretation to every passage of scripture, and that is God's interpretation. What is it God's trying to communicate? And, and at, when he was using and moving along the, the prophets to say th certain things and speak forth his word, uh, what was the framework of those prophets? We need a clear biblical framework to, to interpret scripture and not just freely speculate. Uh, you, when you do that, you leave the, uh, you leave the it, room open for just wild, wild conclusions. Uh, to this day, you hear people talking about secular, especially how oh, there's millions and billions and maybe trillions of years before the uh, Genesis one, or maybe between Genesis one and two, there's millions of years in there. Uh, maybe, um, maybe when Israelites left left uh, Egypt, they didn't cross this Red Sea with with uh, uh, huge walls of water on each side. No, they just walked around uh, through knee deep uh, swamps. And, you know, see, it, you leave it open to interpretation. God's not going to do that. He's very clear and concise on his word. And he gives us these parameters, framework, in order to interpret and understand. So an example, if God sent an enemy to battle Israel because of their rebellion against him, he didn't want the people to look at that event and say that Israel was defeated because of the enemy was stronger, their leader was smarter. Or that their God was more powerful, the God of the field, the God of the mountain, the God of the waters, whatever. No, sovereign Yahweh wanted it to be black and white. He, wanted, he made the prophets write down the behind the scenes story of how he was orchestrating events and why. An example is from Amos 3, 7. Indeed, the sovereign Lord never does anything until he reveals his plans to his servants, the prophets. Okay. Uh, but why then would God bother to do all that? Well, this is because God made contracts uh, with the nation of Israel. He wanted everyone to know how the parties of the contracts had behaved. Are they doing good? Are they doing bad? Um, how's things going? Let's do, have an evaluation meeting here. Um, is God keeping up his end of the bargain? Is Israel? How's Israel's behavior? And so the prophets um, their job was to uh, to to uh, assess and to write down the uh, what was going on, to record and to warn. So the prophets were the ones who monitored and reported on God's and mankind's behavior regarding the covenants that were made between them. So based on their records, the characters of the two parties would reveal that well, is God faithful and sovereign, or well, man. Uh, is sinful. You know, that's, that's what you're going to typically see. God's faithful. He's sovereign. Man is sinful and, and, and weak, really too weak to hold up their end of the bargain. So another aspect of the, the, is the prophets and their job, this is uh, also from past lessons. We've looked at this. This is a reminder that God, they were God's prosecuting attorneys and lawyers. So, uh, when the people broke their contract with Yahweh, the prophets acted like the prosecuting attorney, attorney and announced what wrong the people had done and how they had broken the contract. Okay, And then uh, the third aspect is that they, um, they were the writers of God's word. So besides recording, uh, writing down God's interpretation of history, God also gave the prophets new information to record in scripture. Importantly, nothing the prophets wrote contradicted what God had given in the law or in previous revelations. That's the cool thing about the, the, the writings of the prophets from the Old Testament is, is there is consistency all the way through. Thought it covered hundreds and thousands of years and for the fourth telling of scripture and the foretelling of, of events that hadn't yet happened to, to very uh, intricate detail. 
and 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 many of that was fulfilled uh, for example of the person of Jesus Christ when he came uh, all the details of the fulfillment are amazing and yet, and then there's other prophetic things that are written in the old testament that are not yet fulfilled we're going we're going to get to see some of this play out ourselves at, in different different uh, time frames and time periods and uh, so they were all in agreement. That's the beauty of the word of God, that, that in no point does it contradict. There's some things that are kind of fuzzy. It's like, oh, is that a contradiction? Is that uh, what, how, what's going on here? But if you, if you do some study and you understand what's going on in the framework, you can see that there, there is consistency, 100% consistency, in fact, between all of Scripture. Uh, why is that? It's because scripture comes from God, from a single source. If there were multiple gods, you might have multiple different versions of history. But no, there is one God, um, Yahweh, uh, in the person of, of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, who spoke forth his word. And, and so all of history spoken through the prophets are consistent as they come from one author. So here's what the prophets are not. Uh, some people believe that the prophets were social reformers or early day revolutionists, but no, the prophets did not create any new laws nor social standards. Rather, they reacted to how mankind behaved based on the laws that God had already written. So uh, just keep that clear in, in, in our minds. So the message of the prophets. Many of the prophets are mentioned in scripture aside from the prophets who wrote the books of the Bible. Some ministered in the north in Israel and others in the south in Judah. Each one wrote and expressed the message in their own unique style under God's guidance. However, there are two overarching themes that you're going to see in all of the writings of the prophets uh, in this time frame. It the one of them is cursing and the other one is promises. So you're going to see this constantly cursing and promise, cursing and promise. Uh, um, God, God makes promises and some of them are conditional and some of them are, are, are unconditional. And then the ones that are conditional, you see if, if uh, they're broken, there's cursing. And so, so that's what's going to be con uh, consistent. Um, we're gonna let's go through a couple of points here about cursing and some details on that, and then in a in a in a later recording we'll go through the the promises of God. Okay, so uh, in the prophets in regards to cursings uh, told the people that they were suffering because they broke the Mosaic covenant. That's what's going on, guys. You're, you're experiencing droughts. You're experiencing natural disasters. You're experiencing uh, war and enemies pressing in on you and abusing you because you rejected the Mosaic Covenant. You are abandoning it. You're breaking your part of the deal. They made it very clear that uh, the suffering that they're going through is not random whatsoever. So Yahweh was in full control of their discipline when he intentionally caused nature to work against them uh, and, and directed wicked enemies like Syria and Assyria to, de to defeat them. God was also providing or proving that he wasn't just the ruler of the Israelites and Judah, but also of all the pagan nations as well. That everyone had to submit to his will. God wanted Israel to know that he was in full and complete control and that the, the rod that he used to spank them, <laughs> to discipline them, was, for, uh, was necessary for their repentance to come back and turn back to him. So this is what God said to the Syrians through the prophet Isaiah when he defeated Israel. It says in Isaiah 37, verse 26, what, but what, but have you not heard? I decided this long ago, long ago, I planned it. And now I am making it happen. I plan for you to crush fortified cities and to reap heaps of rubble. That is why their people have so little power and are so frightened and confused. So this is God telling the Assyrians uh, that, that the reason 
uh, this is happening. The reason I'm allowing this to happen is because Israel is in rebellion, um, not because of your amazing might um, or because of your Assyrian gods. No, this is because of me. So God had to put that in writing through the prophets to remind not just Israel, but the, all of the nations that surrounded of who he was. But why did Yahweh want Israel to know that he was causing their defeat? Well, it's because he was encouraging them to repent. Yahweh's discipline was always intended to help them turn away from their wicked ways. And that's what, again, that's the same thing. The example I've been using about uh, parent and child uh, responsibilities and relationship. You know, you don't discipline your kids out of anger and frustration and, 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 and go uh, cross the line and, and, and beat them. No way, no way. Uh, this is done from uh, an act of love. And discipline is done in a proper way. You, you don't just knock a kid off the side of the head. Uh, with a shoe. I mean, you're talking that it's, those are abusive actions. Um, there, there are specific ways to, to discipline children that are healthy, that, that, that bring their heart and their attitudes to repentance um, uh, uh, through physical discipline. And, and, and in le- other, other sessions, we can talk about those, but, um, but it, it, it suffices to say that parental relationships is, is similar to what God is looking for, for repentance, uh, to have a, a circumcised heart attitude toward God. Also, it was to help them bear with suffering, okay? If they understood that they were still God's people, you know, uh, and that he was still in charge, they would know that there is a purpose to their hardship and pain. And I did this with my kids uh, constantly. Guys, I know you're not enjoying right now my discipline. It's not pleasant for you. It wasn't fun. I know that. But don't forget, I am your father. You are my son. You are my daughter. I love you profoundly, and you will always be my son, my daughter. And this doesn't change your, who you are and your identity. Your behavior, yeah, it reeks. It stinks. You know, you got to change it. Your attitude stinks. You got to change it. And that's why I'm confronting you. Um, I'm helping you repent and come back around. Because if I just let this go, you are going to destroy yourself. And so I'm helping you understand what it means to be a person of character made of in the image of God and to reflect his glory. So God is doing the same kind of thing with Israel, uh, teaching them that, no, I love you. You're my son. Uh, you're my spouse, Israel. Um, I haven't abandoned you. Uh, I want you to repent. Unfortunately, in Israel's case, they did not repent. This is caused tremendous, tremendous problems. I want to close here for this particular session. Um, and, and, and then in our next session, I want to go into detail about how the prophets communicate this cursing message to the people. Uh, and, and a little bit about what this uh, uh, Reeve format that was used as the prophets confronted them. And there's a lot of detail in that. So I'm going to leave that for our next recording. May God bless you. And uh, may this be an encouragement to your life today.